So this is sparsity take two. So let's see where we are. So the general idea of sparsity is the idea that we're looking in the problem where the object of interest for us a function depends on a few building blocks. And the way we actually made this precise was by taking a real marker. Purple class. Assuming that the function we're looking for are a combination of not so many things in the following sense that we uh, actually restrict ourselves to the combinations of a linear combination of finitely many features. That's the linear model case that we use throughout, not because we love the linear model per se, but because we're not going to go further than uh, parametric models. So you can consider instead of xj some function phi jx, but it's going to be given, and you're going to consider it most finitely many. Okay, so it's basically just a change of notation. Have you seen throughout? Oftentimes, uh, you can just consider the linear model as long as there is not much difference. Um, in kernels, we actually could consider p going to infinity and consider very general feature maps. Here, we're not doing that. We're considering finitely many features, as intended to finitely many dictionaries that are finite. Okay, So we are effectively restricting ourselves throughout the whole sparsity discussion, but the last uh, you know, lecture four about this, which we're going to be taking a step beyond. But for now, we just restrict ourselves to parametric models. Okay, and so for this reason, we don't go through that notation, but we just stick to this. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, okay, we don't have sparsity in the picture yet. The way we formalize sparsity was basically by introducing the zero norm defined to be fine. It just uh, consider the indicator on WJ uh, that checks whether WJ is different from zero. Okay, so. This is one way to write it. It's basically saying, check the vector. Go into each entry. If you see something which is non-zero, count one. Otherwise, count zero. And then go on and some. Okay? So this is it. It literally takes a vector and counts how many non-zero entries it has. This is the way we're going to define sparsity. Okay? A vector is sparse if that norm is small. It's small because if it's small, it means that mostly it has zero inside. Um, once you have a norm, at this point, you might feel tempted to just use it as a regularization terms. And uh, ignoring computation, you can actually do this. And we saw, uh, we discussed a bit that this is equivalent to just looking for all possible subsets of variables and just decide which side is better, OK? Where then the size of the set will be our sparsity parameter that we don't know a priori and we will have to treat as a regularization parameter. What is the problem with this? If I try to use it, say, with least squares, what happens? I thought I was going to talk for like half an hour and you just could keep on seeing it. These squares, you add this guy, and then you wake up. And you're like, <laughs> no, it's non convex. All right? That's what happens. You take this guy, and you have a nightmare because now you know when you're dealing with such problems, you immediately, this limit get something that is combinatorial in nature, and it gets exploding. But then, of course, you can say, I put a neural network on it, but you're not going to do it just yet. Okay? We want to wait a bit more until we just to backpropagate whatever comes. So what, we're gonna, what we said last time is like uh, take a, a, a kind of approximate point of view and say, OK, there's no way I can solve this problem exactly. And actually, it's not clear how to do it. So let's take the first uh, uh, approach, which is the one that came from basically trying to relax uh, the idea of best subset selection. Best subset selection is the idea where you take one feature at the time, then two features at the time, then three features at the time. And of course, this is uh, combinatorial in nature. What was the other approach, the greedy approach? Similar but different. How? Assume you were here on Monday. <coughs> Now, you keep adding them um, one at a time, um, adding like the next one that the most Right. So, I, the way I would say it is that it is kind of the complementary way to do it, it just says, which is uh, 
you add them, but the key for it is that you keep the one that you already selected. Okay, so you, you keep on adding them one at a time, but you keep the one that you already selected and you don't try to look for, uh, change what you've already done. Okay, so this is the basic idea. So clearly this time, every time you go, you know, and add one variable, you look from size one to size two groups, it doesn't explode because you're always fixing the first, uh, you know, if you look of size uh, m, you fix the first m minus one elements of the group. So it's always linear, okay? I've seen a couple of flavor, one which is particularly lazy, where you just compute the coefficients every time you select, and then you don't update them. The other one where every time you select something, you recompute the coefficients. Uh, in both cases, there was a, um, a selection plus update. Okay, both methods work this way. Uh, again, names here are greedy methods. Uh, Page-wise, forward-wise regression, matching pursuit, and all the variants of this. Okay. I don't know if I told you, but a, a cute name for this uh, kind of best subset selection problem that uh, you find in some books is uh, torturing the data until they can fail. But it gives us somewhat uh, a feeling that you can actually, uh, it's a kind of a harder problem, and you have to be more more careful because if you work on the data enough, you can let them see whatever you want. Whatever you wanted at the beginning. Um, there is a, a kind of outdated book on variable selection that uh, provides a few insights on the problem, and this name comes from there, and it's kind of fun. All right, so this was approach one. We discussed it a bit at length. We started from this guy just because they are actually half of the story, half of the methods. Uh, they're kind of nice because the computational complexity of the model is somewhat tailored to the, the, the sparsity and hence the generalization. The problem with these guys is that sometimes they incur in big errors at the beginning and they take a while to recover from them. And also that uh, the more you go on, the more you have to spend in computations, okay? If you have to do orthogonal matching pursuit every time you select one new variable, in the update step you have to solve a problem which gets larger and larger. Anyway, this is half of the problem. We left hanging there and we're gonna try to comment on uh, today of why the hell would this be something that works and does it always work? Of course not, otherwise it would beat a hardness result. So it must work on some sub, sub problems. So the question is when, okay? So we left that question there. The rest uh, uh, was what we discussed. Uh, we introduced another approach and we said a few things and uh, uh, the other approach is what is typically referred to as a convex relaxation. What was it? Right. So you basically say, no, I don't like this. This is I don't like this part because it's non-convex. So I try to get a, a non-convex. So I replace this term with just the absolute value of Wj. Okay. So before, I, if Wj was zero, it didn't count it, and so it does now. But now, if it's different from zero, it doesn't count one. It counts whatever its its magnitude in absolute value. The sign doesn't matter. Okay. So in that sense, it's the first way to see it as a relaxation. And you know, once you do this, what you obtain is now what you call the L1 norm. Okay. The idea here is now to consider exactly that. You replace this. With we start, you know, stop pondering one second is uh, it, this doesn't look too different from L2. I basically remove a square there. Why does it make such a big difference? Why is it such a better approximation of L0? And to do this, we, we draw a plot, okay? That was basically trying to get the feeling of the kind of problematics on underlying um, And this is the set of solutions of the problem. Okay, so we gave this kind of uh, pictorial uh, representation of what does it mean to solve a problem like this, or rather the constrained version of that problem. And we basically said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to look at all the possible solutions that satisfy this linear system, and then among them we're going to find the minimal whatever is norm. And we saw that uh, from this picture you start to get a feeling of why L1 is very different from L2. If you see, uh, anybody want to say this for me? If you 
look at the intersection point of the ball with the line, it's going to be a point with coordinates different from zero. Whereas if you take the diamond, which is the L1 norm, and, and see whenever it touches the line, it's going to be one point where one of the two entries is zero. And it's not just happening. It looks like it's happening most of the time. Okay? It looks like you have to be very careful if you want to get the sparse solution with L2, because basically, you know, either you get this line or this, or you won't have this result. Whereas for the L1, it looks like if you throw any line on the board, it's going to intersect the, the uh, diamond in only one of the vertices, OK? All right, so fair enough. We're actually going to question this later on. We're going to discuss a bit to which extent, uh, um, which extent this, uh, this result is meaningful, what, it, what is hiding uh, behind this kind of picture. But at least for now, it gives a feeling of uh, what's going on when you see one norm and why it's so different. Uh, by the way, you know, if you, somebody, we were discussing L0 norm, why it's called like this, it reaches a limit, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you remember last uh, time we also introduced the general norms, uh, LQ, say, which are this way. Okay, you just take the qth power and then the, of each uh, term in the sum, and then you take the one over uh, the tth root of the whole thing. So this is the L1, this is L2. And basically what you have is that if you take this Q bigger than 1, if you want, the way you can think about it is that you take this uh, diamond and you make it fat. Okay? You, you inflate its edges outwards. Okay? And for example, L2 is exactly one such version. You take this guy and inflate it. Okay? What happens if you let Q go smaller than 1? Okay? So what you have is that instead of having a, you know, something like this, you start to get something like this. So the various Q, the smaller is Q, the more you get something where you know, curved is, a, is, is concave rather than convex. Okay? You, you can just do it in 2D you know, to convince yourself if you've never done it before. At the limit, okay, what you're going to get, when Q is equal to 0, you're going to get something that basically gives you just a cross. Okay, it just the, all this guy just collapse on the axis, and that's basically what the zero norm is. In the you going to zero of this whole thing, which clearly is with this kind of the sparsest possible situation. So Q equal one in this. This is another sense which you can see. So this is the first way to see why this is a convex relaxation. I take something that counts zero one, and now I let it count zero and the real number, which is the size of the vector. This is another way. Of, the Q norm, which is the non-convex, and you basically go to the first norm in the, in the Q norm families, which is actually convex, okay? And the, that gives you the good result. And if you want, this is another way to see how uh, this is a convex relaxation, okay? Uh, any questions about this stuff? Yeah. So could you kind of like approximate the zero norm using an arbitrary norm by pushing it closer to zero? Like what if I chose a 0.01 norm instead of a 1 norm? 0.01 is going to be non-convex. Oh. 1 non-convex. As soon as you go, you know, it, literally as soon as you go above 1, you make this round. And you know, on the outside, as long as you go smaller than 1, you make it concave. So convex, concave. So one is the boundary between convex and concave. Okay. So again, people this, then of course you can start to say, okay, you know, forget about convexity. Let me see how far I can go with the with the concave stuff. Okay. And maybe I do 0 0.1 or 0 0.1 half, and you can check exactly what is the boundary between this. It's possible to do it. Okay. And you're gonna have that the optimization becomes much more problematic because you're dealing with non-convex problems. Okay. Even starting from a zero norm, if you ignore a computational issue, it's fine. Okay, it's just that you don't know. Okay. Anything else? Also, if we fail to suppose solve it for some q less than one, it wouldn't give us any advantage, right? 
from my intuition. Uh, it's, it's not completely clear. It's not completely clear because again, uh, so, so far, you know, as soon as you kill L0, and so the question is whether there is an advantage to consider Q smaller than one or other classes of Q. At least for the discussion, it's not clear because for now, I just told you that I take a problem, I throw it away, and I replace it with another problem. Okay, so how much I'm paying for this is unclear. Okay, so for now, it, it's hard to compare this problem and this one because for now, one is the right one and that one is another one. Once you go and try to quantify, you can actually check and try to answer in a quantitative way to your question, see if getting closer to zero can give you a little edge. And then it turns out that indeed it is the case. Okay, we're not going to really see it, but that's what's going on okay. from a statistical point of view. Um. So let me make one small remark, and before we move on, what we want to do today is discuss uh, a, a little more of this. We're going to discuss it, the, some computational aspects of solving this problem, and then going back to um, some statistical aspect, exactly the story of what, under which condition we can use these approaches uh, with some guarantees that they're going to solve the real problem. And out of this, we're going to go in the direction of starting generalizing to L1 approach to other approaches, introducing what we usually call the real reason, elastic mass regular reason. Before doing that, uh, let me just comment briefly something that you, uh, a, f a few people mentioned in passing last time, which is how about PCA? How, how is PCA related? Okay? So PCA is what? PCA is a way to define a basis of the spaces of, uh, of the Ws, OK? So the W, each W is of size RT, because I chose the random dimension DT. And what is the PCA? It's many things, OK? It's a dimensional reduction, blah, 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 blah. But what does it do? It takes uh, the space, it defines the data matrix, which is this Diagonalize it, get some eigenvector. Let me call them v1 to some vk, okay, which is the number of eigenvector I want to consider. And then he uses this to do some kind of dimensional dimensionality reduction, okay. Typically, how you take this whatever vector you have and you multiply by this guy and you get a bunch of number which are your new coordinates, okay. This is the five minutes introduction to PC. Another point of view you can take is that you're actually choosing a basis. Okay, you're choosing a basis in this space. If k is big enough, it's going to be a basis of the whole thing. If k is smaller, it's going to be some subspace. From this point of view, you see basically what's going on. I mentioned and I stressed a few times that sparsity is not a concept that can live independently to the features we decided to use. So here, sparsity is with respect to the canonical coherence, to the to the orthonormal basis in uh, in. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on and so forth. And if you choose another basis, okay, you are considering no, the notion of sparsity. Whenever you rotate your basis, you don't you get that sparsity can disappear completely. Okay. So suppose that and, and what you're trying to do now is not to extract the interesting features okay, by possibly combining them or doing some strange operation, but only to select among the features you've decided you want to sparse against. Okay, so you fix the features, and now among those features you want to select a subset. It's called subset selection problem because of this reason. Okay. How are these vectors related to the original feature? A linear combination of them. Okay, each of these vector, it's a basis, which is a linear combination of that. Okay, if that one was a basis itself, it's going to be a rotation of that. Otherwise, it's just going to be a linear combination. So suppose that you just take, I ask you the following question: Consider the first principal component, okay, and now figure out what are the interesting variable in my data. So literally, you have, you know, this big matrix, okay, with all these columns. And I want to know what are the indices of those columns, okay, that are important. And you have to do it from the PCA. How do you do that? It's not clear. It's not clear. Again, each of these guys is itself a linear combination of potentially all of them. Okay. So it's really 
It's not obvious how to get information about which variable to select once you have the PCA. And it's really, you know, there's not much more than going on there. It's not obvious. I mean, it's just that there is a confusion between doing variable selection and doing feature extraction. Of course, this is a good way to extract a new set of features. And for example, you can decide if you want to be sparse against this new set of features, OK? So one thing, that's one thing you could do. You could say, oh, I take my data. I, uh, I diagonalize the covariance matrix. I get these new things. And then I, do the, I use this as a basis. So for example, you know, instead of writing W, which intrinsically we think that we are doing EJW, you're just applying the, the canonical basis to the MLN TJ, I can consider new coefficients, tilde, which are now the Okay. I, I now consider the as a basis my my vector of principal components. Okay, you could do that. Okay, it's just another thing. Again, I'm just I'm not I'm not using PCA to define to find the best coefficient of the canonical basis. I'm using PCA to define a new basis. Okay. And these are the way you can play with this, but there is no obvious way to you know. You just have to remember you're using things that are different nature. Okay, you you if you try to use this to solve this problem, it's weird and it's not clear how to do it. People thought about things like sparse PCA, where they basically try to say, when I do PCA, instead of saying okay, this guy is going to be a linear combination of my columns, okay? Uh, you can say, okay, um, or rather, let's say, in let me just write it in words because uh, the details I get confused otherwise. So each of these vectors is a linear combination of uh, on all the possible dimensions. You can add another constraint and say, what if I want this vector to be a sparse combination of the initial variables? And sparse P PCA is in that direction. Okay, and, and you can go in those directions. But if you just do plain PCA and L1, they're really shooting for different problems. Combine these initial variables to get some interesting direction. Whereas this guy is just doing select a subset of the variables. OK? Does it make sense? Anyway, let's think a second about it. Uh, this discussion about the connection between PCA and this offers another perspective on the connection between L1 regularization and L2 regularization from the spectral filtering point of view. What's the difference between um, let's say a, a zero or a one, so sparsity like that, doing some of uh, principal component analysis of the X matrix, and then reducing the rank of it, forcing the, the, the middle part, or cutting the small like about. Right. So that's what I was trying to explain now. So let me let me try to reset. Okay. Mm -hmm. the question, and let's see how you can answer using these two methods that you described. Okay, that's what I was trying to do here. I choose these measurements because I believe they are interesting. Okay, they are how, how tall I am. Uh, you know, what is my body temperature, my gene expression data, of stuff. Because you want to understand uh, if I'm Italian. Okay, and you want to use one of these two algorithms. But the thing is that you also want to know which exactly of the measurements you made gave me away. Okay, w what was it? Okay, what was it? Perhaps my accent or my hair, say. One of the two. Which method would you use? That method. That method is going to provide you a list of coefficients. Each coefficient is going to be one to one with one of the measurements. And when you see that there is a non zero, you can say, okay, this guy must be zero. Let's do the other method, method two. So that method is going to solve this problem. Okay, method two is going to do what? You take all this information and you now you know, you have a bunch of people like me and you, you don't. Italians like me, profiling Italians is a you know, kind of important problem in science. <laughs> and you do this, uh, and you do this, okay? You just do this thing here. And then what do you do? You, you know, I can ask you, can you find a subset of these features of all these Italians that describes them? Okay? And I'm saying, tell me exact, you know, I'm not telling you, can you, sorry, I didn't ask you find the combination of features that describe it. I just say find a subset, not a subspace, a subset. Okay, I'm not saying combine this column somehow if I find 
stuff. No, 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 I'm telling you, tell me which of these columns, okay? Does it make sense? It, it, it's, a, it's a big difference, you know? In one case, I'm considering a linear combination of, of variables. In the other case, I'm just considering a subset of variables. Subspace, subset. Of course, which I know nothing about except what you just told us. And you somehow restricted it so that, you know, every principal component vector could only have k elements. One or two components, yes. Yeah. And then you took the first principal component. Would that be similar to doing like... No, there's no reason to believe. So the question, if you want to, I was pointing at a direction where you can see that people thought about how to fix PCA. Okay? Basically it was, when you do PCA, do a sparse PCA where you fix how many non-zero elements you want in this vector. Okay? This is still not answering the question because again, why would you, in some sense, if you already know that you have labels, why don't you do that directly? Okay, and in general, they might be different because you know there's no reason to believe that the unlabeled data and the labeled data has to be compatible. So if you know that you're going to have labels and you want to do selection, use that. Don't do first sparse PCA and then the rest. If you don't have labels, then you do sparse PCA. So mine was more of a pointer towards the direction to fix PCA beyond what it usually does, not the way to make PCA solve the other problem. Um, PCA for me is like a change of pace. Right. right. Yeah, so, I change. so let's say the feature space initially I got it wrong. So if I get new PCA, I can get a better feature space. But no, you, that's not, you're changing the rule of the game. Okay. I told you that I don't want you to change the features. I told you to tell me among the one I chose that are because I told you they're fine and I'm sitting on this side. So, you know, I'm right. <laughs> they're, they're right. Okay. <laughs> Classify, uh, you know, that's not the problem. That's the problem we are not discussing now. The problem we are discussing now is that I swear to God that all you have to do is tell me which of the features that I gave you that are not changed them because otherwise I fire you are important. Okay? That's the question. That's the question. And I, I just asked you the following question. Select which of those features are important. And this is the whole game here. Okay? If you want to play the game that you have in mind, which is, no, 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 the problem of selecting features is is difficult, and I want to do feature extraction. Again, just use these different words. Feature selection among a set, or feature extraction, which is possibly combining them in an even non linear way. These are two different problems. In one case, I have to select a subset of given features. In the other case, combine, combine them linearly or not. Okay? PCA does the latter, L1. Yes, and that's why extraction seems to be a better way. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we didn't discuss it, but doing kernel PCA is very easy from what you already know, and that's doing it in a nonlinear, you know, extra, you know, new features in a nonlinear way, not just a linear. Okay. Um, Uh, is PCA related to L2 regularization? Yes. Okay. We cannot discuss this in passing, so let me remind you here real quick because that's the other comment I wanted to make. Okay. So this is a small parenthesis about connection between L1 and PCA, and now we connect back also to L2 regularization, which is what he's asking. That's exactly the second one. The first comment, if you want, is feature extraction from selection. Okay, so this is kind of the, the summary now that we made sense of these terms to this discussion. PCA is doing feature extraction, this kind of stuff is doing feature selection in a supervised way. And if you go to sparse PCA, you're going to try to do feature selection in an unsupervised way. But we haven't, that's not just for us. Now, if you remember that at some point we introduced, uh, we introduced L2 regularization, okay? And we, we commented on the fact that you can do it with the Tikhonov of regularization, or you can do with uh, iterative regularization, or least stopping like idea. And to justify this connection, we said these are ways to do what? To invert a matrix that is not invertible, right? So what was it? In the linear case, you're basically saying, again, you have this big matrix X. You would like to invert it. You don't know how to do it, OK? And so you, well, you, you, you it, not that you don't know how to do it. You know how to do it, but it might be a bad idea because it might be not. So you try to find um, an approximate inversion. Let's just rewrite this, okay, to notice a difference. Suppose that I give you this linear system, and now you want to write down the pseudo inverse. Okay. 
What is it? It's useful to write it down if you consider the singular value decomposition of x. Okay. So if you do it like that, again, uh, these are n vectors that are orthogonal to each other, and this is an orthogonal base in Rn, this is an orthogonal base in Rd. I can write it down now because it looks like this. This is the sum j from 1 to whatever is the rank of this matrix, okay? Uh, and then, which means that I stop to the eigenvalues that are not 0, okay? The rank is exactly the number of non-zero eigenvalues. And then I'm going to write this, 1 over sigma i, y hat ui, ui are the rows of this matrix, so this is Just uh, uh, the, the way in which you write the pseudo inverse using the singular value decomposition. Okay. If you want, it's, it's the same as I, I'm just applying this equation here and unroll it to the other side. Okay. I take u and I multiply y transpose for u. I, I just like to write it in the same that this is the same as doing what? U transpose y sigma to the minus 1 v. Okay, so you take this expression, plug it in here, then multiply each sides by u transpose, then you do sigma to the minus one, and then you multiply each side. Yes. Inverse sex hat transpose. You say to but Isn't the pseudo inverse just like the solution that we got from least squares before with no regularization? So is right, that but uh, almost okay because. Look at this guy, okay? This guy is gonna be, is gonna be a matrix. So this guy is n by p, okay? You can have two situations. It's invertible, okay? Which, in, in which case, uh, you know, pseudo inverse. Let's say that n is equal to p for the case of simplicity. Okay. Then it means that the rank is gonna be n, n or p, doesn't matter, okay? And you can keep all the eigenvalues. Suppose that the rank of the matrix happens to be smaller than n or p. It means that some eigenvalues are different from zero. So when you take the pseudo inverse, in this sum, you don't put one over zero. You just put one over sigma. And here you sum up to the number of eigenvalues that are different from zero. So would you call this regularization or not? Well, definitely you're already deciding that you throw something away. You don't quite do, uh, you, you just keep everything, OK? So it's not specifically picking what people would call a regularization, OK? So far, so good. I just like to write this for the reason I'm going to tell you now, OK? If you do Tikhonov regularization, we know that you're going to replace this problem with a regularized problem, OK? And what do you do? If you remember, it, you basically start to play around with these eigenvalues. Instead of 1 over sigma i, you actually just do 1 over sigma i plus lambda. Actually, what you do is that you replace, if you do That's right. So Tikhonov correspond to the case where you replace one over sigma i, okay, in that equation, with sigma x divided sigma i square plus lambda. Again, sigma i here is the eigenvalue not of x transpose x, but just x, okay. And you can check that what Tikhonov is doing is actually consider this matrix. So you get a sigma square from here. You got a plus lambda. This whole thing is to the minus 1. And then you got a sigma from here. So Tikhonov regularization is taking this expression and saying, no, 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 look, not only I want to kill the ones that are exactly equal to 0, but I also want to kill the small ones. Make sense? So what are you doing? You're taking these components, is what I told you, in the spectral filtering point of view, you're basically saying, okay, let's consider this component. Let's order them. Oop. So that these are the big eigenvalues. These are the small eigenvalues. And then what I do is that basically I decide Something like a vertical cut. Not quite an exact cut, but it's a low-pass filtering kind of way. It's a window that says, if things are small, I'm going to throw them away, okay, or decrease their importance. 
functions. The brutal way of doing this is instead of letting r be the size of the uh, smallest eigenvalue different from zero, you pick here a number which is m, okay, which is the one you choose. This is the same as doing PCA on the first k components and then cut it. What you're doing is that you're deciding that the basis you want to use is the one of PCA, and then you do a cut. And the cut is vertical. You basically say, no, 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 no. What I'm going to do is that I'm actually going to keep everything on this side and throw away everything on that side. Okay. And notice that you don't do anything on y. All you do is on the eigenvalues. So this makes all these problems linear in y. These are linear methods because the way you act on y is just by applying a matrix. Okay, so this is this kind of uh, this is kind of this vertical cut, okay. Suppose that I tell you now that now if I want to do L one, I can do two things, okay. One is to say I want to do L one on a different basis than this. I don't want to use the, the PCA basis, I want to use something else. And then all this discussion really goes away. It's just that you're you know, the same, you're solving different problems. An interesting insight you have if you actually say, no, 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 let's say that for some reason the PCA is really the basis I want to use. And I want to do L1 using PCA as my basis. So in both cases now I have L1 as my basis and I can say, okay, how do they compare? How do L1 and L2 compare if I chose the basis to be the principal component? Okay? And it turns, does, does the question make sense? And what you get is that uh, and this is basically one of the p sets you have to solve, is that this is a particular case uh, where the, uh, the set of features you're considering are an orthonormal basis, by definition. So the matrix you're considering is an orthonormal matrix, and what you get is that you can actually get the solution very simply, and it corresponds to doing a cut like this, rather than like this. So basically what you do is that you're going to look at not just the eigenvalue, but all these coefficients, and you basically say, when these coefficients are small, I set them equal to zero. When these coefficients are big, I let them live. Okay? So the solution of L1 becomes just this simple operation, just a thresholding of the coefficients of the SVD, which again graphically correspond to the case where rather than say, okay, I order them and I kill them from, uh, say, from a certain level after, here you just say, no, no, I do an horizontal cut, and whenever I see a big coefficient, I keep it. Whenever I don't see a big coefficient, I throw it away. What I just said, you have to prove it, okay? In particular, you, you really, you have to prove it, because it's one of the, one of the P sets. But, uh, uh, but it, this can be seen. So what you see is that when you're doing L1, it's, it's, it's really has a different nature. It's really more of a nonlinear kind of regularization. It can be seen as filtering, but it's a more aggressive filtering on big this, this uh, observation is going to come handy in a minute when we discuss the connection between doing L1-like regularization for signal uh, recall okay, and comparing, for example, L1 with, say, classical Shannon sampling-like theorems. Does this make sense? This is a slightly more complicated. It's actually the way I started the note. I'm not sure this is the friendliest thing, so I'm probably going to change it. But it still gives some insight, okay? Because uh, uh, it kind of says, says even when you do kernels or when you do L2, there is kind of a sparsity hidden, okay? There is sparsity with respect to PCA, but it is a, it's sparsity in a slightly different sense. We're basically assuming that the big eigenvalues are important and the small ones are not. Whereas when you do L1, you're more democratic. You don't decide a priori that, you know, big PCA, that it, the components are important or not. You basically say, no, no, they're a big basic, but maybe I might have a function that is, you know, for which using the last principal component is a good idea. If you use of you're excluding this possibility, okay? Because what he does is that he starts by throwing away or decreasing the importance of this principal component at the end of the spectrum. If this guy is democratic. You just say, I don't care. You know, if, if I have something that, of course, in this case, is stupid, okay? It's not very interesting. But suppose that you have something like this. Okay? This, is, this, is, this problem, you know, I could have just cut it before. But suppose you have this guy. If you want to get this guy with L2, you have to cut here and you have to get all this rubbish Whereas if you do the horizontal cut, you get these two guys and nothing else. So whatever is noisy and crappy here, you don't consider it. Okay? Anyway, your face uh, tell me that it's a good time to stop this remark. And let me just summarize the two points I wanted to make, which are PCA is doing an extraction rather than 
a selection, okay? Because it's just changing the basis, and L1 depends on the basis. Observation. Looking at what happens, if you do choose to use the PCA basis as the basis to which you want to do L1, it gives an another insight of the connection between L2 and L1 regularization, okay? They basically say there are really two different ways of filtering. One is a low pass filtering. This one is a nonlinear filter. It's a thresholding like filters, which is nonlinear because, again, the way it acts is not just on the eigenvalues, but it's all the coefficients. You literally look at the coefficients and just pick the ones that are big enough. In this case, uh, so small eigenvalues that correspond to noise in the data. Right? So you're saying there's something that's noise in the data that is highly correlated with your output. Well, I'm, so I'm just saying. That's the case. Then L1 is the wrong. So I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just telling you that L1. You're actually assuming that that's not the case. You know, you're basically saying. You're basically saying. All I'm saying is, when you do L1, I just stated the fact without uh, you know making it say that it's a good thing or not. I'm just saying when you do L1, you give yourself the opportunity to go and look in the small eigenvalues, as long as they have big components. Okay. Now you can see. Things you can say, okay, I could have two kinds of noise. Okay, one is I can estimate the small the eigenvector correspond to the small eigenvalue well, but I have a lot of noise in the y's. Okay, so there are two kinds of noise: is the noise on the outputs and the noise in the inputs. Let's assume that the noise in the input is small, that you have enough data. Then you estimate all the eigenvector well, all eigenvector well, and then of course you have the problem of basically saying. If I have enough energy, okay, but this is just a matter of how big is this coefficient with respect to the noise that I have in my output. Okay. And that's fine, you know, this reasoning works well. What you're raising is a bigger problem, which is what if I don't have enough data to estimate the the, the, the eigenvector corresponding to the small eigenvalue? Well, it would basically mean that you have to be somewhat cautious in really doing a full L1 like approach because you might actually end up looking in components that are so unstable they don't mean anything. But this is basically saying it's a bad idea to look at this as a basis because you know you should really cut. You should do a combination of these two approach. You cut a bit so that you know that you're not dealing with meaningless PCA, and then in the window that you save, you still do this kind of vertical cut. Okay? Nothing prevent to do both things at the same time. So if you cannot trust your basis, L1 starts when you trust your basis. Basis dependent approach. So you need, and I say basis, but you know, a dictionary. It's a dictionary dependent approach. Okay, you start the game when you know that you have the dictionary you want. That's it. Okay. All right. What about computations? Actually, a long story that we'll make somewhat short. There is a, a relatively longer discussion in the appendix. Uh, so we do have this convex relaxation approach. We discussed a bit why it would make sense. We want to solve things. And unlike greedy method, it's a bit more complicated, right? Because now we have to solve that minimization problem here. Let me rewrite it. Again, I'm killing the 1 over n exponent just to simplify the notation. We have to solve this problem, OK? Uh, OK, is it nice or not? Well, it's not bad. It's not bad. The first term and the second are both convex. What did we lose with respect to what we had before? If you took an L2 norm, you get two things for free. One. Actually, we just said that we already have it, so differentiability. And you get a bit more convexity. Why? Because the L2 norm is not only convex, it's strongly convex. It's a, it's a sharp smile. Okay? So it means that while L2 regularization will have a unique minimizer, this guy in general will have many minimizers. Okay? Now, that's the first observation. Okay? But forget a second about the exact, you know, the minimum minimizer we want. Then one, let's just ask ourselves, okay, how do we deal with non-differentiability? Well, how would you do that? You can assume you've been in this class before to answer this question. Subgradients. What was it? You go in, you compute uh, not the gradient, but the subgradient, which is in case, notice that again we have 
sum, you have to check that the chain rule and the sum rule applies, but then you go in and check the gradients and blah, blah. This is again a simple, you know, that is a simple function. It's just the sum of the absolute values. So it's, it's not bad, right? You can just do that. You're going to have uh, a bunch of uh, simple expression that gives the gradient. This approach in general will not give you sparse solution, okay? Because what happens is that uh, the gradient of this might be sparse, but when you do the gradient of this, in general, it's not going to be a sparse vector, and you're going to add this vector and add them and add them. So eventually, they will have to converge to the right place, but they might be in an L2 sense. So you might have very, very many small values before you actually recover and do the right correction, okay? So we might have a, a solution which is uh, getting closer to being sparse, but in nowhere sparse in any of the steps of the subgradient. On the other hand, the observation that was made is that this is not a generic problem, but it's a problem with a lot of structure, because it's the sum of a smooth term and a non-smooth term, okay? Two terms are convex. This guy is not differentiable, but this guy is differentiable. So this is actually a, a specific class of problem. So this is convex, non-smooth, and this is convex, smooth. It turns out, and this is a small op optimization uh, parenthesis, that this problem has a certain amount. And we can study it quite abstractly. abstractly. Let's just say, Error, I use e to remind you of an error function, but it's a generic function. And R, which again, I use to remind you something like a regularizer, but it's a generic function that goes from Rp to R. And for us, it's even going to be in a zero plus infinity. They're going to be positive valued function, OK? Because we have errors plus regularizer. Now you have to minimize. So now you make some, you have to minimize. But this is not a generic problem. It's a problem with some structure. It's the sum of two functions. And I'm going to make exactly this. We want to make exactly this kind of assumption, OK? One is that R is convex. You can do less than this. But for now, let's just mention that these guys are continuous, OK? Uh, I can tell you why you might want to do a bit less than that. But for now, let's just say they're continuous because that's Let's say that R is convex, so we're going to think as R as our regularization term. And then we're actually going to say that E, convex but also smooth, and we're going to put the, the usual assumption we make when we looked at uh, uh, gradient-like methods. Okay? When you try to optimize, suppose that I give you just the function E, and you want to try to optimize it, what do you use? Convex and differentiable, what do you use? Gradient, OK? And what do you need to assume to be able to use the gradient? You have a control on, you have to choose the step size. And to choose the step size, you need to know the bound on the action or the Lipschitz constant, OK? You're going to make the same assumption here, that we have this magic L, which is a bound on the action of this guy, OK? The, the precise way of doing it is just the, you know, the one that that, which is the one where you take the gradient, two points, and you require the gradient to be Lipschitz continuous. Okay? Again, in, in, the, in the case of uh, one dimension, this is basically saying you can just get, assume that this is a bound on the second derivative. Okay? And in general, it will be a bound on the action. This is more general. So we do assume that there is an L for which this holds. OK? So if you want, what you're doing is, on the R part, we make minimal assumption. OK? We just say it's convex. But on the E part, we make the usual assumption we make when we want to use gradient descent. We say it's differentiable, it's smooth, and actually have a bound on the Lipschitz constant. OK? Far so good? It turns out that the way you solve this problem is a, is a kind of a nice interpretation. And the spoiler is that it looks like projected gradient. OK? In which sense? You're going to take a gradient with respect to the part for which you can take the gradient. And then you're going to write something that looks a bit like a projection that depends only on the 
R term on the regularizer for us. Okay? So this method are called splitting method because in some sense they really decompose the contribution to the algorithm of this term and this term. So, oopala. the method looks like this. What I wrote doesn't still make sense because I, let me just say, I, I start from here before introducing the object we don't know yet. So look at this expression, okay? If you ignore this term, it's just creating descent of the smooth part of the error term. But here I have this thing here, which is going to be a nonlinear operator, a nonlinear map, okay? That depends only on the regular. And I haven't told you what it is yet, so that's what I'm going to do next. Tell you exactly how this projection looks like. It's just a gradient descent. It's promised. Whatever is in the parentheses is just a standard gradient descent. Okay? We have to, we have to say what is this. Okay? And in principle, this thing doesn't look that nice, actually. Okay? It's, um, it seems to be a problem in its own right. So, prox. So this is just a constant, okay? So I'm going to remove it. So you just assume that you have a f any function r which is convex, and I want to tell you what is the prox of that function. It's some kind of nonlinear mapping defined by that function, okay? So I'm going to take this and, and tell you what is on a generic v. It can be anything. It's going to be the following thing. It's going to be the argmin with respect of u regularized version of R. So I take R, I add a kind of regularization where instead of just putting over u, I recenter the regularization over the vector v, okay? And then I take the argmin, I minimize this. I get the, I get the vector that minimizes this and it gives me this expression, okay? What do we have to understand from this expression? There is nothing particularly enlightening in this for now. There's something weird, okay? I'm basically telling you, if I give you a, a regularization r, I'm actually gonna do a gradient descent where I take the gradient step of the error, which is simple, because I just compute the error. And then I have to compute this weird stuff, which is called the proximal operator, or the proximity operator. Corresponding to R. Okay? <coughs> All right, that seems like a problem in its own right, okay? It actually looks almost like the original problem, if you look. Because look, I have the regularization, I have V, I have U, okay? What was the main difference? In that case, here, I don't have, if you compare this problem to, say, the original problem that motivated the discussion, what is the main difference? So R is just L1 norm, and here you also have an L2 norm, but what is the difference? Here you have X, and there you don't have it, okay? And this makes life, turns out to make life much easier. I'm going to discover this in the P-set we designed. Still, you have to convince yourself that trading the original problem for this problem makes sense, okay? So, of course, this approach is only going to make sense if there are cases where there are choices of R for which this problem is particularly simple to solve, okay? If I can show you cases where solving this problem is particularly simple, then this approach can be interesting. For example, suppose that I can solve this problem in closed form and it's a very simple operation. Then what I have to do is that I take the gradient and then I have just to do the following simple operation. Okay? Turns out that for 
L1, if you take here not a generic convex R, but you take L1, and in fact many norm that has kind of a sparsity flavor, this computation can be done in relatively simple terms. Okay? Uh, so let's take R to be equal to some parameter alpha. Let's consider now an example. How does the proximity operator of L1 look like? Okay. So first of all, even though it's an operator that in general takes an input a vector and acts on all the components, this operator is nice because it only, in the case of L1, it only acts one component at a time. Okay? You can describe the action of the operator by saying what it does on each of the components. So all I have to do is tell you what is the jth component of this. Okay? And it turns out that this is something I do on the jth component of W. Okay? So and here's what I do. I take Wj the jth component of the vector w, and I check if it, I check if it's more than alpha, which is the parameter that appears here. Okay. If it's more than alpha, guess what I do? The whole story has to lead somewhere. It has to lead to sparsity, and here it is. If the component is smaller than something, I'm going to set it exactly equal to zero. What if, what, let's complete this, you know, if you see where we're trying to go, let, tell me what you would like to see in the other two lines. One is wj bigger than alpha, and wj smaller than minus alpha, okay? What would you like to see there? All, I kill it. If it's big, I let it be. So I like to see here WJ and here WJ. It turns out that the sort of this is not quite this, but what I do is that if it's big enough, I let it go and I decrease it a little bit. And if uh, if it's too small, if, if it's big but it negative, I'm gonna let it be, but I am gonna increase it a little bit. Okay? How does this operation look like? It's a one dim everything is one dimensional here, right? And what it does it do is that you basically consider minus alpha and alpha. And then does the following thing. Okay? So again, this is and this would be the first of the absolute value. Okay. W. W in the one-dimensional case, if you want Wj. This is what this thing is doing. It's basically saying, okay, I set it equal to So this is what this operation is doing. I'm skipping a couple of calculations here, but they're not too complicated, and they're literally going to do this. They are written more or less in the in the appendix, so you just have to work them out. Uh, this operator, the, the proximal operator uh, for the L1 norm, is what is called a soft thresholding. Okay, for obvious reason, is a soft threshold. Okay, soft is set equal to zero, and here it tried to make it smooth. You can check how the how how would the hard thresholding look like? Well, it would be like this in the middle, but then. Hard. Okay. So I'm skipping the proof. This is just a definition, and I'm skipping the proof because you're gonna do it. That for the L1 norm, this prox operator looks like this. Is the soft thresholding operator.
Now you can just stop, you know, you can digest the fact that you're going to have to do it and I'm not going to do it for you. And then again, just see why, you know, we can just check why this is an interesting thing. There are a bunch of reasons why it's interesting. First of all, I told you that we can exploit the specific opposite structure of the problem, the fact that it's a sum of terms with certain properties to get an algorithm. And the first thing I did is throwing at you another problem. Okay? So, of course, this whole story must make sense only if the new problem is easier to solve than the original problem. And I just gave you a case where it is. And it was exactly the case we started with. It's L1 norm. So if you now you go back and check how difficult it is to solve the L1 norm, it's completely trivial. Okay? Because what you do is that you're just going to do, in this case for us, okay, you're just going to be WT minus gamma. X at transpose, X at transpose W T minus Y. Okay. That's, that's the, the error inside. And then all we have to do is to use this after shoulding operator associated to my to my method. Okay. But this operation, I wrote what it is right there for you, okay? So all you do, so if you think about the procedure, it's the most obvious one. It's kind of the one you would want to use. You do gradient descent, then you look at the component vector you obtain, and if they're small, they set them equal to zero. If they're big, you let them be, shrink them a little bit, which is not exactly what you would want to do, but it turns out that that's what L1 does, okay? And the amount of shrinking you do essentially depends on your regularization parameter. If your regularization parameter is very big, you put everything you see after gradient descent to zero, whereas if it's small, you can them be. Okay. So we now have a, a nice, simple algorithm. Do you immediately write down the analytical solution as like soft thresholding applied to the pseudo inverse of y hat? No. So the question is, I, before I, I hinted at what kind of computation you get in the specific case of SVD, where you only get uh, some kind of softer shoulding on the, on, the, on the eigenvalue. I didn't derive it again. I told you that you're going to do it. Okay? Uh, and here, I'm telling you something that is not as nice. You don't do the eigen decomposition and then just do threshold. You have to, have to run an algorithm. So you have to actually run a full a gradient and at each step doing things. Why? Well, the difference is that this is the algorithm that works when x is whatever you want. And when here, I'm considering the um, L1 norm on the canonical basis, which you know, is not related in a nice way. The column of this and the basis you choose are not related in a nice way. But if you choose the SVD, it's a very nice case. Okay? Even simpler, consider the, what does this story tell you implicitly? That if you put the identity in place of x, it must be a super nice case, right? Even if this is diagonal, it's nice. And in some sense, when you do SVD, you're going to take exactly the one basis that you put here that makes this guy diagonal. So it's going to simplify this even further. Here, you cannot do it, okay? So for, uh, I'm giving you a bit more details out, but the base story, and that's really kind of what you're going to do in the P set, is if you take identity or diagonal, you do it in closed form. If you take the SVD, you still can do it in closed form up to some minor adjustment. If you take a generic thing, you don't. You have to run an iteration where you project at every or threshold at every iteration. All right, so from a computational point of view, we end up with a, with a pretty nice uh, method because it's simple. It turns out that similarly to gradient descent, this method is not super fast. So this is, again, an entry point of two possible directions. One that we're going to touch upon is what if instead of del 1, everything that is on this board and most of the stuff like this has nothing special to del 1 norm. It's only here that we made an example. So can you apply this kind of technology to other norm? Of course. It particularly will be interesting when you can do this, whenever you can do this in a, in a fast way. And it turns out that for a lot of sparsity norms, you can actually do this in fast way, and you kind of get things that make sense. Okay. We're gonna, you're going to see this next class when we start to discuss group sparsity and structure sparsity. Another direction you want to do, which is really the direction that goes into optimization, is just saying, can I make this faster? Okay? This is what is typically called, this method here is called, is called iterative software shoulding, ISTA. Iterative software shoulding algorithm. And if you look on the ISTA 
plus a letter in front, there are a bunch. Fista, Nesta, you keep on going. And there are typically you know, improvements on the speed of convergence of this, okay? Using the Locarno trick to make it faster, keeping the uh, sparsity. And of course, then do stochastic and blah, 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 blah. Okay? This has been a, a rich, a rich uh, contact point between optimization and machine learning in the last five, 10 years because uh, these kind of techniques that were uh, developed uh, became extremely useful. Again, because they boil down to factor their methods, relatively simple operations. Closing the uh, optimization parenthesis. Well, first of all, is there any question on the optimization parenthesis? All right. So, um, closing the parenthesis, which again uh, you you can see at large in the in the supplementary material of the notes, uh, you can actually get another entry point on sparsity. Okay. Because if you want, there is another way to see that you can get a sparse solution. The first question of why you get sparsity, the first answer to the question why you get sparsity with L1 was this, which is kind of geometric. It looks at the variational problem, you look at the optimization problem, and it looks at the geometry of the minimization problem. Okay? And this tells you that the exact minimizer is sparse. This gives you something even more operational, because it basically says, look, if you use iter coding or proximal gradient method, to solve this problem, you're going to actually make iterates that are uh, you know, sparse by construction because you set them equal to zero. So it, I, I don't know, depending who you are, this can be a better route or the other. This, this is like very operational. Okay, you just do some uh, math to derive the algorithm, but once you have it, the algorithm is simple and it's sparse. Okay, if you do L2, what you see is that you can compute the proximal operator easily, and you can actually do it as an exercise if you want. But what you see is that you're basically just making sure that the norm doesn't get too big. Okay. Whenever you get the vector, you rescale the norm of the vector to make it smaller than whatever the constant you took, and there's no way it's going to give you any sparse. Okay. So this guy feels simpler. Okay. Um, Thresholding is just alpha equals zero, so there's no regularization. Like, yeah, what is the hard? So she's asking whether hard thresholding is alpha equal to zero, which is not quite, because if I have to put alpha equal to zero, I'm actually going to shrink this region to zero, which means that I'm not going to set anything. Strictly speaking, if you take this one equation and you take alpha equal to zero, you don't get any sparsity out of it. Okay. So hard thresholding, I just introduced it to tell you what, so I was just telling you, this is soft thresholding because what it does is that it's set to zero in between, and then here it doesn't quite let the coefficient be, but it shrink them a little bit, okay? Hard thresholding would be the operation you do if you don't put this alpha, which is not that, which is not really putting alpha equal to zero because you still keep it here, okay? It turns out that that's kind of what you would get if you do L0 norm. Okay, there are simple cases when you compute the L0 norm solution because the problem you're looking at is not a generic problem, but for example, is the one where you have an orthogonal matrix in which that's what you'd give. So you should think of the R thresholding more as a way to do L0 norm when you can than to do the L1 norm. Okay. <coughs> in general, you cannot do that. <coughs> okay. Okay, so let's see. <coughs> we introduced L1 regularization. We spent a bit of time uh, connecting with PCA and L2 regularization, taking again the spectral filter point of view, which again I, I find that it's a bit more uh, it's a, it's a bit different, but I actually find it very useful, both from a computational and uh, an educational point of view. Why I spent is the second time that uh, I, I bear your confused faces. And then we moved on and discussed uh, computations. And the computation, if you want, is the tip of an iceberg. It's just instead of solving a problem where you have to minimize a function, minimize a special function, which is the sum of two terms. One is particularly nice, and one is, and is nice enough. Particularly nice means convex is smooth. Nice enough means convex, and then discovered that all you have to do is this kind of projected gradient. It's not quite a projection, generally it's not a projection, but it's kind of 
you know, that's the closest thing that probably everybody knows. You do the gradient and then you do some kind of nonlinear operation. The nonlinear operation in general might be hard to compute, but for our cases, in particular L1 becomes a, a very simple operation. It acts component wise. As low as hell algorithm, which is simple enough and can be proved in a bunch of different ways and particularly made fast. Okay. For special cases of the matrix X, identity diagonal SVD, you can actually largely simplify ISTA and get closed form solution. Okay. So what's left to discuss for another? That's one question that remains lingering, okay? Okay, but we started from the zero norm and we just killed it, okay? So what's going on? This is what we want to mention at. It's, it's kind of a long story, so I'm just going to give you a, a short version. I'm not going to prove anything. I'm just going to give you a, a, you know, a spoiler of what is the main idea and connect with sampling. The basic idea here is that if the matrix X is nice and the sparsity is big enough, then you can exactly say how many points you need to estimate things right. Okay? There is not much learning going on here. It's essentially linear systems. Okay? So the connection to learning is a bit more complicated. I'm not going to touch upon it. But here is the main, the main idea. Dealing with this problem, okay? And, uh, again, if I don't tell you that there is sparsity, okay, and you have n equations and p variables, what would you expect? That n has to be roughly bigger or equal than what to try to get the solution? Okay. p unknown, n variables, I'm good to go. Bigger, it's fine. Smaller, I don't know. L0 norm cheats. And says, ah, in some sense, I'm going to do a, a, a computational expensive method. It's going to be able to find what are the right ones. And then how many equations do you think you might need? Probably if you let me call if you let me call W star. One of the best possible solutions to the linear system. And we agree to say that the sparsity or the L0 Probably S will be enough. Okay. I tell you what they are. I don't have an, I don't have the other one anymore. And all you need to do is that. Okay. It turns out that for nice matrices, you get something very close to this. Okay. And when I say D, I mean P. Let's interpret one second this result, and then let me tell you what I mean by nice x. Okay? This says that this if you want is the price you pay for not knowing which components are the important one. If you knew that, then you would do this. If you don't know that, you pay this extra price through this method. Okay? How does it look? look? Not too bad. You know, this one would be linear in the dimension. So if suppose that you have a case where you have a, a 100 point sparsity 3 and p equal a million. Then here you need the, you would need a million points. Here 100 is fine because this is confusion, but it's pay logarithmically here. Okay? So this is a much smaller price to pay. What is the condition that you need on this matrix? Is that in some sense it has to be fairly generic. What you need is that none of the column of this matrix Okay, should be too close to each other. You don't want columns that are very close to each other. You know, when you get something close to collinearity, it bothers you. Particularly if the columns are the one that matters. Suppose, for example, that the first five columns are important. I need those columns not to be too close to each other because otherwise I enter kind of a degenerate situation where I don't really know which one to pick. Okay? Similarly, if there is somebody else who is 
So in some sense, uh, this doesn't work for a generic matrix X. It only works for matrix X where you know that at least the important columns and certain conditions are stronger than that. But at least intuitively what you would want to say is that at least for the important columns, uh, they're not too close to each other. You, are, you stay away from uh, kind of a degenerate, okay? Sense. This is by no means a proof, but it's just something that kind of makes sense, okay? And then you can get this kind of condition. The matrix that have this property are kind of matrices with are somewhat generic, okay? If you just take, say, for example, a Gaussian, meaning uh, a Gaussian matrix in the sense that you build the matrix and numbers inside, it actually typically has this matrix, or if you take a Bernoulli. If you take, uh, so th that's, kind of a, th that's kind of a nice point of view, okay? Uh, one thing that we want to discuss is that you actually take a matrix in learning, there's no reason to believe that you know, the, the important variables are not going to be correlated in a fun way or collinear in a fun way. Okay. But I have to live with it. And so this problem, this becomes still a very interesting question because it shows you that there is a whole set of problems for which you can get very good result solving a simple situation. This is restricting the class of problems, right? It, you cannot take a generic X. You have to take a, an X of nice enough matrices of size like this with problem like that, okay? Does this make sense? This, if you want, is kind of the content of a lot of work in high dimensional statistics and compressed sensing, okay? The point of view in compressed sensing is the following. It's really more of a, of a processing point of view. You basically say, I have a vector W star, and I would like to somewhat sample it and then be able to recover it exactly. And suppose that you just, you know, this is just a, a classical signal, and then you want to use frequencies as a basis, okay? So you want to use Fourier. Then Shannon sampling tells you exactly how many samples you need. Okay? How many you need. Roughly twice the maximum frequency of that vector, okay? Instead of frequency, you just think in terms of sizes. This basically tells you back this. You would have to put the two here, okay? This vector, I, I take my vector w, I write it on the Fourier basis. Now I change basis, and it becomes of dimension p, because it means it doesn't matter. If I sample at twice the rate, which is basically what I did here, which means that I have to put a matrix x here, which are going to be exactly the Fourier matrix. You just go and select. It's, it's not our data matrix. It becomes a matrix that I choose. And I choose a set of vectors, okay? And I take these coefficients, okay? Then if I take bigger than 2p, Shannon sampling basically tells me that from this vector, let me call it y, I'll be able to go back. If you tell me x and you tell me y, I can go back to w star. This is the assumption implicitly made that any frequency matter, that if you go in the spectrum domain, in the Fourier domain, you have a band Minus p again. I'm a bit sloppy here. Yeah, I'm mixing a bit the indices with the frequency point of view. Okay, there will be the bend in the frequency domain. And basically, this tells you, look, everything here matters. And you have to, if you sample twice the frequency, then you're going to get everything perfectly. In some sense, this guy is saying, well, what if, say, my voice doesn't look like this, but it looks like this? It does have just some frequencies, not all of them. Can I do a better job and sampling at a better rate? And this basically, this kind of theorem tells you that you can. If you can design this matrix so that you satisfy this assumption, and in a similar processing point of view, you can design that. Okay, you can design, you're gonna use the Fourier, we're gonna extract Fourier coefficients, then you can try to get essentially exact reconstruction. You can reconstruct the signal exactly, even if you violate the Shannon sampling request. Not because Shannon sampling is not uh, is not sharp. It's just because it's ways. Shannon sampling basically assumes that every dimension matters. Back to the linear algebra, it's basically saying you really have to compute all the numbers in the vector, and then you need, you know, order uh, dimension of the vector frequency to be there. Okay. So that's kind of cute. It's a kind of a nice question, and the whole say compressed sensing point of view has been used. Uh, uh, you know, has pushed this kind of direction. The, the, the typical situation are, you know that there are signals that are sparse on a basis, okay, say images, and then what you try to do is rather than first sample a lot and then maybe compress, so you, you buy a very expensive camera and then you put it in your computer, you want to try to do the other way around. You, you, you try to build the camera that knows that you're going to put a JPEG in your computer, so you just sample thing in a kind of a, in a much more parsimonious way. So if you one pixel camera and this kind of stuff, it basically goes in this direction. <coughs> and I think it's just a pointer. It's more than that. Uh, 
Okay, I'm over time. The thing that I'm going to touch upon next time is uh, the big difference is that in, in signal process you can design this. In machine learning, you actually get it from somewhere. Okay, and so if you you cannot ensure this kind of uh, lack of linearity between columns, and the first question we want to ask next time is how do you deal with that? Okay, how do you deal with the potential correlation among the important variables?